Today I'm going to show you a light-hearted and useful Home Assistant integration called Spook, which adds some, shall we say, interesting functionality to Home Assistant. And when I say integration, I would liken it more to an expansion pack of a game. It extends some core functionality of Home Assistant and enhances some of the core Home Assistant integrations. It will tell you about problems with your Home Assistant setup, allow you to dynamically create and update areas, and some fairly pointless functionality too. Before I go any further, I have to say that this video is all thanks to mostly Chris who did a video on it recently. So thanks Chris for finding this gem. I've put the link in the description to his video. His video is half an hour long though, so I figured that I'd create a video for those of you who've got a shorter attention span or already know how to install integrations with hacks. I'm going to briefly skim over the install side of things and then go into some of the functionality and its possible uses. The original developer of the integration is Frank. If you don't know who Frank is, he works for Nabacasa who runs Home Assistant. Particularly in the early years, he basically single-handedly built some parts of Home Assistant and some of the best integrations well, before Nabacasa even existed. Spook basically started off as Frank's pet project and now has a couple of dozen other contributors as well. It's worth noting that just like Hacks, Spook is not part of the official Home Assistant project. Now let's take a look at what Spook has to offer. The project has a GitHub repo and some great documentation to go with it. And if you have a read of the documentation, you will certainly find that Frank's personality is all over it. To get it up and running, simply search for Spook in Hacks and press download a couple of times. As is often the case with custom integrations, you play the game of how many times do you need to restart Home Assistant before you can start using it. In this case, you will need to restart Home Assistant after you've done the Hacks bit and then add the Spook integration. Once you've done that, you need to do a final restart. They have made this nice and easy whereby a restart button pops up which will restart Home Assistant View automatically. Okay Mark, so I've got it installed. What does this integration actually do? Well, the documentation has broken it down quite nicely into core extensions, enhanced integrations, helpers and other features. The first bit I want to show you is repairs. The repair section of Home Assistant was introduced in August 2022 and is a really nice way of seeing things that you need to sort out in your system. In a fully functional system, you shouldn't really have any repairs. These either indicate devices which have issues or deprecated functionality whereby you need to go and change or remove something so that it keeps working. Boot looks for some issues that Home Assistant doesn't, such as letting you know about orphaned entities which need either removing or fixing. You can see that in my dev system, I have three repair issues, all caused by a missing entity. I used to have a Zigbee Smart Plug installed, which is no longer connected, and so it has raised an issue about the entity not being on the dashboard and two issues about it being in an automation. I suspect that if you don't housekeep your Home Assistant instance very well, then you might end up with quite a lot of issues to resolve the first time you install Spook. Now this nicely leads on to the Spook integration piece. If you go into the integration section and select Spook, then you will see three devices. One is just called Home Assistant, one called Home Assistant Cloud, and another called Repairs. If you click into the Repairs one, you can see how many issues you have and choose to ignore or unignore all if you want. The logbook shows you when a repair event occurred and you could even use the repair event entity in an automation to send you a notification to your phone whenever a new repair event occurs. Later in the video we're going to take a look at all of the service calls which have been added or amended thanks to the Spook integration. One that has been added is the ability to create new repair events yourself. You could and maybe already are using persistent notifications for alerting you to certain things, but instead you could use persistent notifications for things which need to be actioned more immediately or may be acknowledged by other family members and perhaps repair issues for technical things that need to be sorted out at some point soon. Persistent notifications are visible to every user, whereas realistically it's only going to be you as the admin of Home Assistant who is going to actually be fixing the issues. The first example that came to mind for me is detecting MQTT devices which are perhaps still working but going offline regularly. You could create an automation that looks at the state of these devices and creates a repair issue. Again, you might want to use persistent notifications or even phone notifications instead, but the functionality is there if you want to use it. 
Now let's go back to the Spook integration and take a look at the two other devices. If you click into the Home Assistant Cloud one, you will see five entities. In my case, they're greyed out because the instance isn't connected to Home Assistant Cloud. But if it was, then it would give you the ability to actually enable or disable voice assistant connections to Home Assistant. You can also disable the ability to remote control your Home Assistant instance via the Home Assistant Cloud as well if you want. And the final device called Home Assistant, I don't think is particularly useful, but it's interesting to see how many different types of entities you have. When I install Spook on my production instance, I think the numbers are going to be quite scary there. Now we're going to have a look at all of the Spook related services and talk about a few of them as we go. If you go to developer tools and then services, scroll down to the first service, which has a little ghost icon next to it and select it. You can then copy and paste this ghost and put it into the search box and it will show you all of the Spook related services. The first one adds the ability to automatically add a blueprint to Home Assistant via a URL. Generally, I think you would want to be importing blueprints manually so that you've got some control over them, but let me know in the comments if you think this is going to be useful for you. The next set of services allow you to create and delete areas and add entities to those areas. This might be useful for entities that aren't completely static in your home. Perhaps you've got some portable speakers like the Sonos Move, which sometimes is in the kitchen and maybe sometimes is in the garden. You can have a button on your dashboard or an automation which moves it between the kitchen and the garden areas. And then when you play some music in a specific area, it will either include or exclude that speaker depending on the area that the speaker's in. I can't think of many other uses at the moment for this, but I'm sure you guys will come up with some. Now hidden between these services is an option to delete all orphaned entities, which I quite like, which I find that sometimes when you restart custom integrations that they can leave old entities hanging around. So just bear in mind when you do this that it might remove some entities from integrations that you've got problems with or are disabled, but normally those integrations will recreate those entities again for you anyway. We then have some services which allow you to enable and disable things, so you can disable integrations, devices and entities. There's also a service to hide and unhide entities, which means that then those entities won't show up on your dashboard. I actually probably have a use for this one for my Christmas automations. I currently manually enable and disable entities and integrations each December for the various Christmas lights that I put up around the house so that Home Assistant doesn't send out all these requests for 11 months of the year when the devices are offline. So I'll probably wrap all of this up into a nice little automation and then maybe have a button on the dashboard so that I can enable all of this functionality each December. Some integrations, generally cloud polling ones, will automatically poll for updates at regular intervals. You could use these services to enable or disable that polling. Maybe if you are getting close to an API limit, or if you only need data at certain times of the day. For the Google Maps integration, I have polling disabled, and then I've got an automation which calls built-in services in Home Assistant to do manual updates at certain times of the day. You could instead use this service if you wanted to do a similar thing. The next one is an interesting one which actually allows you to change the entity ID of an entity. I imagine you could get into a bit of a mess with this one if you've got a lot of automations that are linked to an entity and then you change its ID. This is another one whereby I can't think of a use for it at the moment, but I think there will be some really interesting uses. So again, let me know in the comments if you come up with a use for this one. The next set to do with numbers, input numbers and input selects. You can increment, decrement the numbers and also set maximum thresholds. I've got some solar related controls which might benefit from these service calls. The random service for input selects might be a fun one. You can have a list of phrases in an input select and then you can get it to randomly select a phrase and then use this in your phone notifications to your partner's phone to make it a bit more interesting on the things that they receive. The add and remove device tracker ones could be really interesting. If you have some sort of location based automation set up depending on whether you're at home or if you're not at home, then you've probably found that at some point it can become problematic. For example, you use your phone to determine whether you're home or not, but you don't actually always take your phone out with you. Or maybe you use a combination of device trackers, but you still end up with the same problem, with Home Assistant thinking you're home when you're not home, or vice versa, when you don't have all your devices with you, it thinking you're home when you're not. With this, you can dynamically assign and unassign device trackers to a person. Maybe if you're going away for a few days and you know that you're not taking a specific device with you, then you could unassign that device temporarily from that person and then even have an automation to maybe automatically reassign it to that person when you expect to be home. 
The next one is a very geeky frank one, which allows you to directly record long-term statistics against an entity. Sensors such as temperature sensors already store things like min and max statistics automatically, so I can't see many people using this one. You're probably more likely to break your stats than improve them, to be honest. The next ones relate to the repair issues I talked about earlier. So if you click the create issue one, then you can see that you add a title, description and severity of the issue. It looks like that you can also set whether they're persistent over home system restarts or not. I suspect that most of the time you'd want to have these as persistent until you've actually fixed the issue. I think the next two were created just for fun by Frank for amusement. The service calls don't do anything. One of the jobs is to always fail and the other job is to generally succeed but randomly fail. You perhaps could include these in an automation if you're testing out some functionality and maybe want to know how it behaves if it fails at a certain point, but other than that I can't see much of a use for them. The next one is a simple one and one that I thought already existed, but it seems that it doesn't. You can already start, pause, finish and cancel a timer and you can also add or subtract time from that timer, but you can't change the duration of a timer using a service call. Well with Spook now you can. This service call allows you to set a specific duration for a timer. I think that this one will get added to core functionality of Home Assistant at some point this year, particularly when they start adding functionality to the voice assistant. Setting a timer in the kitchen is pretty much the only thing I do with my Google Nest Hub. With the help of Spook, you can now create, update and delete zones with a service call. I can see this one being really useful and I'll probably use this one myself. Sometimes I add zones for specific places we go to so that we can then monitor when we're in and out of those zones. The UI is nice and easy to use, but you have to enter the latitude and longitude and there's no easy way of adding in your current location for one of your devices. You have to go to your device tracker entity and then copy and paste the values. And you can't just click into the entity from the dashboard because the latitude and longitude is rounded to two decimal places, which can make quite a difference to your location. To get the full coordinates, you need to go to the developer tools and then states and find the entity from there. With these services, you can create a button on your dashboard which takes the current location of your device and then creates a zone for you. It will probably be best to have an input box as well so that you can give the zone a user-friendly name from the UI. And the last service call to mention is the ability to force restart Home Assistant. Although in the documentation screenshot it shows the little ghost icon, it seems to be missing from my version, but the options for force restart and restarting with safe mode have been added. I've never had the need to force restart Home Assistant really myself. Usually if I've tried to restart it and it's not working, it's because it's doing something in the background like creating a backup. The first portal call should always be checking your logs, but if this doesn't give you the information you need then this service call might come to your rescue. Well that's all of the service call features covered but there are just a couple more features to show you. The Spook integration adds an inverse helper which is another piece of functionality I plan to use. If you have a switch or a binary sensor which shows closed when something is open or open when something is closed then you can fix this issue with this helper. I have this issue with my back gate. I use an Akara water leak sensor connected to a reed switch but the reed switch I am using only has the normal open terminal and doesn't have the normally closed one and this means that it shows the state as open when the gate is closed and closed when the gate is open. To even get this far I've had to change the device class from moisture to door but it still has the problem of them being the wrong way around so this helper will solve that problem for me. I could probably fix this problem with a template sensor but I try to avoid them where possible and just stick to the core functionality. And the final piece of functionality is some added functions to the Ginger 2 templating engine. You can generate different hashes such as MD5 and SHA and this could be useful for making some API calls using the REST sensor. Some will authentication methods require you to generate some sort of hash as part of the payload that you send in the header. So it might be useful for this. There are also some pattern matching functions which seem to be simplified versions of regular expressions. I could see these being quite useful. I find that Home Assistant has so many good features that I don't need to use very many template sensors myself in my system. But if you want to geek out then you can certainly use them and these functions might help. Coming across this integration is like having a special 13th release of Home Assistant for the year. Hopefully I've covered enough features to tempt you into giving it a go yourself. And if you give it a go, let me know in the comments what pieces of functionality you plan to use. Thank you to Frank and everyone else who's involved in this fun and unique integration.
Well, that's it for today, so please consider subscribing if you haven't already, liking the video if you enjoyed it, and thanks until next time.